Gotcha. Hello everyone and welcome to the top 10 things you didn't know about the greatsword in Monster Hunter World Iceborne. That's right. This video was made recently. It's not super old. There's a lot of old videos out there that give tips on the greatsword, maybe like a moveset guide. But you know what? The weapon has changed a little bit for Iceborne, and it's time to talk about those changes, and it's time to take an examination of what the best players are doing with this weapon. Let's go ahead and get started with the list. The greatsword is one of the easiest weapons to use in Monster Hunter World because it's so uncomplicated. You basically just have the charge attack and the tackle. <laughs> uh, maybe the clutch claw attack, maybe a ledge hop. So you would think that there's not too much to have to know about how to use this weapon, and yet there are things that I'm willing to bet plenty of you guys don't know. Example, this tip here. Did you know you can overcharge the greatsword? That's right. When you're on your way to using true charge slash and you're charging up your swings, if you hold the button down too long, you will actually do less damage. So the correct time to let go of the button is when your character suddenly has that little sound effect pop in and the little uh, there will be like a glow that comes over your body and that's when you're supposed to release the button to have optimal damage output. But if you continue to hold the button down, especially if you hold it all the way until it automatically attacks for you, you'll actually do significantly less damage. So that's overcharging the greatsword and it's a bad thing. And I would love to know how many of you guys didn't even know about that particular trick. To get the best damage, again, you need to release the charge just as your character begins to glow and just as that sound effect kind of pops in, that's where you get your optimal damage. So tip number one, overcharging the greatsword is a thing. Don't do it, it reduces your damage. Tip number two, for true charge slash, as you know, there's two hits to that move, right? There's the little early hit, is kind of like a light hit, and then there's the heavy hit. Well, guess what? If you don't land the first hit, the light hit, if you don't land that, you don't get the powered up version of the second part of the move. You'll notice this if you take it into the training room. Just notice when you're using your true charge slash, it's actually gonna have in brackets the word powered, okay? And what it means there is you've landed both parts of the move. If you were to miss that first part, you will have a weaker true charge slash. So if you're ever fighting a monster and you're like, wow, I did an unusually large amount of damage there, or maybe you landed a true charge slash and it just seemed really weak for some reason, it's very likely that you were missing that early small hit for the true charge slash and you just didn't realize that that mechanic even existed. I know for me, that was actually a new one that I just recently learned. I just never noticed it before. It's actually a very small and interesting detail because not only are you understanding why the damage changes sometimes, but also now you know when you're waking up a monster, if that first part of the strike is not landing, you're not getting as much damage on the second part. And so if you could have this condition occur where the monster is falling to sleep just as you go into TCS and you manage to land the small part of TCS before the heavy part of TCS comes out, you get an even larger amount of damage on the wake up. And you see speedrunners doing this with the new Safajiva Sleep Greatsword. Moving right along, I have a tip for players who are probably a little newer to the Greatsword. Okay, so if you've played the Greatsword since the base game, you probably already know this one. Uh, but basically, we're going to go over how to ledge hop with a Greatsword. Everyone should know how to do this. It's a great skill to know, especially if you're trying to obtain a mount on a monster very quickly. The Greatsword is one of those weapons that just does so much mount damage when it does a ledge hop that you're able to get that mount and deal a nice chunk of damage. So what am I referring to when I say ledge hop? I'm talking about a specific type of aerial attack where you're jumping off of a ledge and then you're using a move that pulls you back onto the ledge, and you just repeat this over and over again. Back in the base game for the Greatsword, this was really OP. In fact, it was one of the top tier forms of damage in the base game. However, they nerfed it. They nerfed the aerial damage on the Greatsword, and then they buffed the flight decoration, the airborne decoration, but this did not compensate for the nerf on the Greatsword. So now we don't see as much aerial Greatsword. However, it's still really powerful, so you will want to know how to do it anyways. So basically, while standing on a ledge, you're going to roll off of it, and then you're immediately going to hit Y and forward towards the ledge in order to go into a charge attack. You're going to hold the Y button down on the PlayStation controller. That will be the triangle button. Okay, so you roll backwards off the ledge, 
immediately press that Y or triangle button and hold it down while pressing forward. This will send you into an aerial attack that pulls you back onto the ledge. Usually what I find with people who are learning how to ledge hop with the greatsword for the first time, what they do wrong is they they don't anticipate how quickly they need to switch from pushing the roll button to the charge you know charge attack button right you have to you have to swap very quickly you roll and then immediately start charging okay so the faster you do it the more successful you are all right and then you can just do that over and over and over again again it is an excellent tool for mounting monsters quickly and it racks up quite a lot of damage the fourth thing you didn't know about greatsword is that you should be landing the true charged slash just as a monster finishes recovering. Okay, and this is a really terrific gameplay tip because when you do an analysis of all the experts, they play the weapon exactly the same way. They go into their early charges. Sometimes they skip the first charge by rolling and going into a tackle. They rarely skip the second charge unless they know they have to. If they have to skip the second charge, typically what they'll do is they'll fire a slinger burst and then finally, they will go into True Charge Slash, and what is so impressive about them using their True Charge Slash is they release it just as the monster finishes fully recovering from a knockdown, and often what you will see is the monster will then be, they'll be flinched, or they will be drooling, or they will be just straight up knocked down all over again. So if you want to be really skilled with this weapon, that is probably what you need to learn how to do with the weapon. You need to learn how to time the true charge slash so that you're always punishing the monster when it is recovering from some form of crowd control. And you don't just waste your crowd control by landing the TCS too early. You actually take full advantage of all the damage you're dealing by landing it right after they're done recovering. So that might be the most important tip on this whole list, by the way. The fifth thing you didn't know is that expert players are sometimes bringing earplugs on a meta damage build for the Greatsword. That is a build that is basically a glass cannon, and the only thing it's there to do is enormous amounts of damage. And they would bring earplugs. And the question is, why are they doing that? Well, it kind of branches off what we were just talking about for tip number four. We were talking about stagger locking monsters as they got up from being knocked down. What do a lot of monsters do after being knocked down? They roar. So you've got monsters that roar, and you might be in the middle of the TCS animation. It's a pretty slow animation. And if the monster happens to get the roar out because uh, that's just how they're timed, you're not going to get the TCS to land. So yeah, we saw players who would have in the charm slot the earplugs charm, and then in the coil slot you would see the Nergigante coil. And this is something you're going to consider on your... Not, not all monsters required. Think about it. Like if you are fighting Kirin... Of course, you're not going to ever need earplugs, so you would put something else there, like Peak Performance is a great replacement, maybe Handicraft if you want to pick up Purple Sharpness. Alright, for tip number 8, we're just going to briefly cover something you guys have probably already figured out, but some players might not have figured it out, and that's you're allowed to use a Slinger Burst in the middle of your charge combo, right? There's three levels to the charge. You can do the light swing, the medium swing, and then the TCS. That's the heavy swing. Well, in the middle, you can fire your slinger pods if you want to reach TCS sooner. We do see some expert players doing this. The only time they do this is when they know they won't have enough time to go through all three animations. It was interesting because you would expect maybe they could do like a double tackle, but they would actually choose to go with the slinger pod burst instead of a double tackle in order to reach the true charge slash sooner. Another thing that we saw a lot of when I was analyzing speedruns is you would see players charging up the second swing quite often. They like the second swing and I totally understand why because I remember in the base game I was doing frame testing where I would uh, basically measure the DPS output of a particular move which you can do if you have editing software which allows you to use timestamps and frame by frame imaging in order to get an accurate measure of the damage output of your swing. You didn't want to skip the second swing. That's what I learned. The second swing, not only did you not want to skip it, you also did want to charge it because that would end up leading to higher damage output overall. And so, yeah, you see a lot of the speedrunners definitely charging up the second swing for as long as they're allowed to. And by that, I mean they would charge the second slash as much as they could, but they would still land the TCS just as the monster recovered. So there's a very, you know, there's a very static window of time, I imagine. Tip number seven is another interesting observation I had when I was watching experts playing the greatsword. So we all know, well, you're supposed to know, that you can iframe through a monster's attack, and then the greatsword is known for having the tackle 
and the tackle is capable of hyper armoring or what you might call poising through a monster's attack. Basically the monster smacks you and you do not get knocked over and you actually deal some counter damage to the monster as well, which is nice. What I found interesting is there would be players who were so good at tackling, they didn't just use the tackle that you would get in the middle of charging your weapon, they would use the rolling tackle. You guys know what I'm talking about. If you're a greatsword main, at the end of a roll, you're allowed to tackle, right? You, you would just push Y, it would skip the first swing in your charge combo. And here's what I found really interesting. They were so good at doing the roll tackle that they would see an incoming move, and what they would do is they would roll too early for the iframe for the roll to count because they didn't want the iframe from the roll. They wanted to go into a tackle. So they would roll, tackle, and then they would punish the monster right away by going into the second swing of the charge combo, right? Uh, I can't remember the name of it, but you know, they're trying to get to TCS as fast as possible. So what is the short version of what I'm trying to explain here? Basically, that is pretty much always better to tackle through a monster's move rather than to roll through a monster's move. So if you're not charging your weapon, but you can roll early and then tackle, do that. Learn to do it. Becoming an expert at the roll tackle will lead to you being more efficient at reaching the TCS when a monster attacks you. Tip number eight is for the new players, people who might have just picked up the great sword and they're not sure how to build it. Of course, you will build crit eye, weakness exploit, crit boost, right? All the, the typical things. However, there's an additional skill that you must have on your great sword build. I keep trying to say charge blade in my mind. I have to change it because I've been playing with the charge blade. Anyways, it's for the great sword and that's the focus skill. The focus skill is used on the great sword to get to your TCS sooner because your, your great sword charges faster when you have the focus skill. Does it affect your damage output? Quite a lot, actually. Once again, going back to the base game, I remember running uh, frame testings for DPS, and I discovered that players who had the focus skill had significantly more DPS because the move came out sooner. And this is not just important for getting your DPS up, it's so important for having the flexibility of timing when the TCS lands. It's so important to be able to land it at the correct time. Tip number nine, you do not need the master's touch skill for your greatsword. That's right, there's a lot of pieces of armor out there and the master's touch Teostra armor is not the most efficient, it's, it's decent pieces of armor, but it's not the most efficient pieces of armor for any build. However, people would take it because they wanted to obtain master's touch in order to maintain purple or white sharpness. Well, great swords don't attack with great frequency, right? So if you're using, let's say the long sword or the lance, you know, you poke, 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 poke over and over again, and then your sharpness gets driven down pretty fast. Insect Glaive is another great example. The Great Sword is really not like that. The Great Sword hits like just a few times, and then you're going into TCS, and it's a big chunky blow. Well, because it's like that, you don't lose your sharpness too quickly, and because we now have the Safajiva weapons, what you would see, uh, you would see the experts, well, they would have two types of awakened abilities going on in their builds. First of all, you would see no weapon skills, uh, no, I'm sorry, no set bonus skills on their awakened weapons. They would go all attack, and then they would have one level of sharpness. So one of the slots was reserved for sharpness five, or they would take sharpness six. This is the part that I'm still confused on that I think they're still debating amongst themselves on their speedruns. Because I saw people who had top speedruns with, or, you know, very, very fast speedruns with these various different uh, awakening uh, setups. So some of them would take sharpness six, and this would give you a little more purple sharpness and they would take handicraft two in order to get that purple sharpness to be uh, large enough to last fairly long throughout the speed run you know the speed run they're going to kill the monster fairly quickly and they will have enough purple sharpness that it lasted most of the run then you would get other people who would not do that at all they wouldn't bring any handicraft and their sharpness would only be taken to level five on the upgrade on the awakening right and instead they would have attack six so they would have white sharpness a taxist a six and no handicraft in their build which means that they can replace that with a different skill such as peak performance which one is better uh, i suppose it's hard to say i would bet that is actually a very fine line between which one is better so i'm not going to make a recommendation i'm just going to explain that there seems to be two different pathways that people are going on my particular builds we're not going to be working worrying about the purple sharpness we're going to be sticking to the white sharpness Speaking of my builds, 
The very last thing you didn't know about the greatsword is that you should be using these builds. Let's take a look at the two builds that I'm providing for this video. The first build is going to be my damage setup for the greatsword. You'll notice we have in the awakening for the weapon, we have sharpness 5, not sharpness 6. We went with the tack 6, just like we were talking about the different options there. And you can see we have a small sliver of purple sharpness that we could obtain if we wanted to, but we're not going to worry about that. We're just going to stay in white sharpness. And then you'll see for the charms, we have the earplugs charm, which again, I mentioned when a monster stands up, a lot of them roar right after recovering. If you're in the middle of your TCS, that roar can't interrupt you and your TCS will land. Uh, and then you see very standard builds here, or skills here, crit eye, agitator, attack boost, crit boost, weakness exploit, focus. They're all there. You'll also notice that I was able to fit health boost onto the build as well. I don't run any build without health boost. Of course, if you were to drop it, you would be able to finish attack boost. If you're fighting a monster that doesn't roar, be sure to drop the earplugs charm and trade it out with something useful like the handicraft charm, which will bring you up to that purple sharpness, or you can trade it out with peak performance, which is probably what I would do. I would probably go for peak performance. The second build we're going to be talking about is my defense oriented build. Of course, we had that huge week where I spent the entire week playing lots and lots of different defensive setups. I think that was two weeks long and I learned a great deal. This will be a mixed damage defense and offense build, it is possible to build a lot more defense with like Valhazak armor, defense boost seven even, which, you know, is it sounds surprising, but it actually is legit when you pair it with everything else, including like recovery speed. So this one's not like all defense. This is a mixed one. Health boost and divine blessing secret will take you a long way. It's very powerful. Uh, one of the things you'll notice here is we have a poison greatsword rather than a blast greatsword. It's a little fun to point this out. The golden loon helm alpha gives you two levels of poison attack, which probably doesn't really contribute very much damage at all. It's just, I don't know, it just makes you feel fuzzy inside when you see it on the build. So we have a poison greatsword here, but of course if the monster was immune to poison and weak to blast, you would trade over to the blast greatsword. And if you were playing by yourself, you could trade out to the sleep greatsword, which you could have done on either build. All right, so in this case, we do just give up a little bit of damage instead to pick up the divine blessing skill, and that's going to make you a lot more survivable. So honestly, this will probably be the build that I prefer rather than the damage one. All right, and that is everything I have for you. The 10 things you didn't know about the greatsword in Monster Hunter World Iceborne. Let me know if you learned something new. Let me know if you literally knew everything in the list. I want to thank you all for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.